Welcome to The Simple Truth. It is a privilege to be able to be a, a part of the, uh, the family of God and uh, fellow Christians. And, and as I've been teaching on the Great Commission and I'm teaching uh, about sharing your faith and, and the importance of it, uh, I, I want to back up a little bit from last week and, and share a couple of scriptures I ended up with uh, of, of why we share our faith with other people, why we should be doing this, and, and why we shouldn't be having any kind of excuses not to. We should have that boldness. And the first scripture was found in, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, and it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. He that, for you and I to, to live a righteous life, to follow after Christ uh, is a testimony in itself, and but but to win souls is the wise is because that's what God wants us to do, and it leads to eternal life. And you and I, though we have already gained that eternal life by trusting in Christ and following His plan and following His commandments and doing them. We still need to be teaching others to follow after them also. Uh, I talked a little bit about Psalms chapter 111. Uh, there's 10 verses in this psalm, and I, I want to go through them. Uh, I did part of them last week, but I, I want to start over and start with chapter uh, Psalms 111, and start with verse 1. And it says, I will praise the Lord with all my heart, uh, or whole heart. And the assembly of the upright and in the righteous, with my whole heart. That's commitment that he's talking about there. Uh, I will do it with joy. Um, I will do it with boldness. Uh, and not just to fellow Christians, but also even in the congregation, uh, I will praise the Lord and, and give him the praise for what he is doing. Not what I'm doing, but what he's doing through my life. Verse 2 says, the works of the Lord are great, studied by those who are uh, have pleasure in them. We are to study His Word, we are to meditate on His Word, and when we see God do things, in, in not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others, that's when we need to give Him the praise. Uh, even in times of a great difficulty, uh, I the Lord brought to mind that that when I was sitting in the front of an ambulance and and my late wife was in back of the ambulance and the EMT was working with it, he said, now's the time to praise me. And I want you to understand that that to me was not the time to praise him because I finally understood how serious the situation was and yet... He said, now's the time to praise me. And I did later, but at that moment, I couldn't. You know, I, it just hit me what had happened. But even in those times, we should be praising the Lord for, for what He has already done in our lives and what He's about to do, because He does great things. So uh, continue to praise Him and marvel at His great work that He does in our lives. And even in the most tragic time of your lives, allow His praise to come on your lips. It says, um, verse 3, He works, His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. I want you to understand that, that there is no way to explain the great things that God can do. I cannot explain to you how someone gets saved. Only that it happens. Only that it's supernatural. Uh, it is a spiritual thing. And it happens and you can see the change in a person's face, in a person's life when they truly accept Christ. And it brings joy to you. But think of the joy that it brings to God that this is another child that has come to him and has accepted him. And his work is honorable and it is glorious. 
It is awesome, we will say today, it's awesome what God does. And His righteousness endures forever. His right doing towards you and I will always endure, endure and endure forever. Verse 4, He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. I want you to understand that when we see the works of God working in our lives and we think about, we know ourselves better than anyone else except God. He knows what I've done wrong. He knows what he's done right. And still, he has this great compassion on me. And he has it on you. So that... Uh, he is very gracious to us. He loved us so much he sent his only begotten son so that you and I could have a peaceful, loved life and know that God is with us all the time. He has compassion on us when we fail him. And yet, he's always waiting for us to turn and come back to him and to follow after him with, with you know, and I find it that, that I trust him more now because of the things I've been through than I did when I first accepted him. Now, verse 5, he was given food to those who fear him, and he will ever be mindful of his covenant. God wants to provide for you. He wants to protect you. He wants you to, to have abundance in all things. But he's always mindful of his covenant. He's always mindful of what he has said to you and I. What he has put down. Uh, he's always mindful of the promises that he has made to his people. And he's always mindful that we are human. And yet... He still has that compassion for us, and he still wants you and I to follow after him. He has declared to his people the power of his work, and in giving them the heritage of the nations, he, ha you know, he, yes, I understand that the Old Testament, he's talking mainly about Israel, but, but we can, we can count on that also in this New Testament time, that he has declared the power of his works to his people. How powerful is it that someone gets saved? How powerful when we see someone being healed? How powerful if we've seen someone delivered from, from drugs or alcohol or, or other things that, that we just can't even imagine, and yet God has provided for us and protected us and still working in us. And he's given us the heritage of the nations. In other words, he has given us the heritage of his kingdom that is to come and is here now. Verse 7, the works of his hands are varied in justice. In other words, uh, they are uh, many. They're true. It, it, you could render this as, as his hands, the works of his hands are truth and and justice. His works are true and they're just. Even in this perverse world that we live in. The rest of that verse says all of his precepts are sure. His laws are constant. His commandments are sure. They will not fail. Uh, when God says he means it and there's no ifs, there's no ands, no who buts. Uh, we talked about it in, in a previous program that when God speaks, his word goes out and it will accomplish what he set out for it to do. And it will not come back to him void. What God says, you can bank on. It is something that you can trust and you can believe and it will happen. Verse 8, and they stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and righteousness. Again, he's talking about uh, his word is fast. It is forever and ever. Uh, it is truth and it's upright. It is righteous. Uh, 
Uh, verse 9, he has sent uh, redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. This, these last two verses, he said, he sent his redemption. He sent Christ to bring redemption and faith to this world. And through his obedience, Christ's obedience to the Father, it was accomplished. And God is trying to accomplish through us further redemption of this creation of mankind towards him. And we that were not a people are now a people. And it's through what Christ has done on the cross. His commandments and covenant is forever. It is not negotiable. It is forever. It will not change. It, it doesn't need to change because it's perfect in all of its ways. Holy and awesome is his name. I don't care whether you call him Jesus or Wonderful Counselor or, or the Son of God or, or, or Messiah uh, or Savior, it is an awesome, holy name that Jesus has because it's God's name, the great I Am of the Old Testament. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments his praise endures forever. The fear here is not being scared of, but have reverence for. So we could, we could read this. The reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I am not scared of the Lord. I respect him. I have reverence for him. Uh, I, I listen to what he has to say to me when he speaks to me. I listen to what his word is saying to me and I meditate on it so that I will hear his voice through his word. And it tells me that's the beginning of wisdom. That I'm no longer looking at me or, or circumstances but at the wisdom that God has given to each one of us through his word and through the understanding and experiences we have with him. Uh, his praise endures forever. I want you to know you can praise him now, but when we get to heaven and we go into eternity, it will be praise all the time. We will continue to praise him by seeing the great things that he has done through our history. And yet, it's not over. We will praise him forever. All right. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Go back to the Old New Testament. Not the Old, the New. Uh, 2 Timothy. And I want to go to verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 6. And as, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Now, get this picture. Paul is talking to a young preacher that, that has been under his ministry for uh, some time. Uh, I'm not sure how long, but for some time. He is now pastoring the church. Uh, and as Paul is, is speaking to him, he says, I want you to stir up the gift of God which, was, which is in you through the laying on the hand. Gifts can be given to, to equip the saints by the laying on of hands. Um, in ordination, they lay hands on the young person that, are, uh, that is going to be ordained. Uh, it is laying on the hands to um, give them spiritual gifts that they can use to equip the saints and teach and minister to other people uh, in the love of God and in the truth of God. And Paul's saying, stir that gift up. Now, we don't know what gift he was talking about, but he said, stir up that gift. 
that was given to you by the laying on of hands. And verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Evidently, we can only assume, and I know that gets us in trouble, but, but Timothy was like many of us, and he, uh, in the ministry, it is, it is work. Uh, you have times that you have victories, uh, and you see the joy of changing in people's lives, and then you also have those times when things aren't going exactly how you had envisioned them to happen. Um, you, you can get discouraged in that. And, and that's what Paul is telling him right in this verse. Uh, God has not given you the spirit of fear, of being uh, timid, of, of being uh, downtrodden, uh, to uh, being um, maybe, well, I don't know how many times I've talked to pastors that, that and I even said it myself, oh, I need to get out of this. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. Uh, I ought to quit. And yet... You knew that God had you in the place that you need to be at that moment and in that time. And you continue. Let's start this verse over again. For God has, given us a, has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He's talking about we have the, the ability to make good decisions. Uh, it also includes having self-control and self-discipline. Uh, there's times when we need to say, whoop, that thought is not good. You need to cast it out, get rid of it, quit thinking that away, and allow for the truth and the faith in God to come into your life again and to overcome those times when we, we have doubts, the times we have fear, uh, whether it's of our ability or, or the, what someone else is doing, uh, our faith should not be in ourselves or other people, but in Christ alone. So uh, have that sound mind. Have the love of God. It's not just talking about loving someone. It's talking about the God's kind of love, and it's talking about God's power in the gospel. Verse 8, uh, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of your Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began you know we should praise God for the testimony of the Lord because he was sinless, he was obedient, and he was faithful to the Father. All those things are the same characteristics that you and I need to have and not be ashamed of the gospel. And we shouldn't be ashamed that, that Paul at this time she was a prisoner because Paul was one of those people that it was it didn't matter whether he was in prison or out of prison, he preached the gospel. He did not stop just because of the circumstances he was in or the situation he was in. But share with me in the suffering of the gospel according to the power of God. Uh, we, you know, I can remember when I got saved that uh, some of my friends uh, really didn't want to spend time around me because of the change of, of attitude that I had, the, the change of wants that I wanted to do, the change of the things that, that I no longer want to be a part of. Uh, and yet, uh, I was fortunate that I had friends that, that allowed me to do that, uh, even though uh, we spent less and less time together, but still uh, have somewhat of a friendship going on. Uh, and I'm, I'm believing that the Lord is drawing them closer to Him because they're seeing the change in me that God has done, not that I've done. Talking about uh, uh, not according to our works, not according to what I've done, but according to what God has done through my life and through other people that they see uh, uh, according to the purpose 
that God has and the grace that He has, which came to you and me and to them that haven't accepted Christ yet, the grace of God, the compassion of God that came through Jesus Christ to us now. Okay. Uh, but now being revealed uh, by appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life into mortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded by he who is able to keep what I have committed to him until the day. We're going back to verse 10. It has now been revealed through Christ that salvation has come to the Gentiles, but not just the Gentiles only. The Jews are still uh, can accept Christ and follow after him. Uh, it says that death has been abolished. Now, you may have a little problem with that because we've had family that die. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that I had a, a wife that passed away. Uh, she's in heaven today. Uh, we talk about death. But I want you to understand that if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, death is only a door. Uh, the Word talks about walking through the valley is a shadow of death. It's just a shadow. It's just a an event. Uh, it's not over yet. We go from, from this natural life that we live in and that we preach the gospel in and that we teach in to eternity, to being with Christ forever. Paul tells us in one of his letters that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So it's just a moment in time that we go through that we call death, but it's only a shadow. It's only a doorway into eternity. And it's one that you and I not need to be afraid of, but we should not hasten it either. Uh, we should uh, wait for the fullness of time when we have completed the plan that God has put before us. And I believe that God will keep us together doing what we need to do until his time to bring us home. And I'm talking about into eternity. Right now, we need to be about what we're doing here and, and drawing more people to Christ, lifting Christ up instead of uh, uh, thinking about death, okay? Uh, so, uh, and he was brought to life and immortality to light through the gospel. Uh, Jesus died for us. And he rose again, defeating death. And we have that already won for us in the future, at, in the fullness of time, as, as one of the Gospels talks about. Uh, and then Paul talks about himself again in verse 11, that he was appointed a, a preacher, an apostle, and teacher to the Gentiles. Uh, that was a plan that God had for his life. And yet it's a plan for, for you and I to uh, preach the Gospel uh, not necessarily as a pastor in a church, but, but as a Christian who shares our faith with other people to draw them closer to God. And Paul said, it's for this reason I, I also suffer these things. Never left, I'm not ashamed. Paul was saying all the things, all the disasters I went through, he was stoned. He was in a shipwreck. He was in prison, uh, you know. All those things, he did not change his mind about how he felt about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not change his mind about the things God was doing through his life. And he was steadfast to continue in those things so that he was not ashamed of the gospel because he, he uh, as he puts it, for I know who I believe and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. And that day is, is, is the second coming of Christ. But he says, even though I've suffered, I know who I believe in. That personal relationship that you and I can have with Jesus Christ. It has to be personal. It can't be just a historical figure. He has to be a personal friend and Savior 
and Lord to you. It is a personal thing. It is a one-on-one. And I, I believe that and I know that with him. Uh, and I am persuaded, he says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him. Paul and you and I, we should be persuaded to know that we know that we know that the things that we're doing for God, he can keep, he can multiply, and he will continue to do because we've committed to him. We're committed to Christ, not to a ministry, not to a profession, but to a Savior. I do these things because of my commitment to Christ. He has shown me his love and he has continued in my life. I think I've got, I'm not sure. Well, I don't, I can't remember where I have it in this book or in one of my Bibles, I have written a, 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 uh, commitment that I have made. This is a commitment that I have made to the Lord. I found it in a book somewhere and it hit me so hard that I had to write it down and I put it in my Bible. I cannot turn back for I have entered into an irrevocable contract with God. I have committed my life to Jesus Christ and he has given me eternal life and I signed my name to it. And I want you to know, there's no turning back from where I'm at right now. There's no turning back from following Christ. There's no turning back from trying to do all that I can to fulfill the plan that he has for my life and to follow him no matter where it takes me. I have committed this life to Jesus Christ so that I can enter into that eternal life with him forever and ever. Paul goes on and says, verse 13, uh, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love, which is of Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit continue in you and to hold fast to what God is calling you to do. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power the boldness, the, the courage to follow after Christ, even in the worst of times, even in the hardest of times, and even when we may be at our lowest point and feel like we can't go any farther, the Holy Spirit is there. Continue to encourage us as we try to encourage each other. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Speaking of the blood and the cross, I'd like to read a scripture out of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 15. You may want to listen closely to this one. And for this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament, that by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. Is talking about the cross of Christ. Did you notice what it said there? In that verse it says that those in the old covenant were saved at the cross of Christ. Hebrews 10 says that the animal sacrifices could not take away sin. It's the only thing they knew in the Old Testament, but it was ratified at the cross of Christ for all men.